Welcome everyone to Hawthorne University's webinar series. I'm Paula Bartholomew and I'm sure delighted to be here together today and to be able to facilitate this special presentation. We'll sure have question and answer time and you, I'll certainly respond to your questions and your comments as well as the presenter at the end of the presentation. But I'm encouraging you now to write your questions or your comments into the webinar question panel at any time just so that you're in queue and everybody's ready for it. And also a reminder that this presentation is being recorded and it'll be available on our website in just a few days for replay. So today's focus is bacteriophage therapy. It's a potent, effective, and safe technique to help clients recover from infection and recalcitrant bacterial infections. So you want us to purposely ingest a virus to destroy a bacteria? <laughs> Say what? <laughs> I don't know. But yes, yes, yes. That's exactly what we're saying, that this technique of bacteriophage therapy is what it is, and it's growing in therapeutic popularity in the West. It's fueled by centuries worth of research, refinement, and application throughout Europe and Russia. This therapy offers a potent, refined, targeted therapy for many of the bacterial-based challenges of our modern time without the collateral damage of antibiotics. And we're about to join Dr. Sarika for an engaging overview of this powerful new wave of wellness in the West. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Cernahaus. She's a practitioner of acupuncture and Chinese medicine using Japanese-style methods LED light therapy and herbal medicine in her private practice. She's the author of a importance and practical application of traditional food preparation techniques, the Funky Kitchen, and its accompanying online course, Fresh, Fun, and Flavorful in the Funky Kitchen. And she's a coach for a metabolic balance of Germany, from which she has crafted a personalized weight optimization and lifestyle program, the WAPIS method. And since 2011, she's been sharing recipes and health articles on her website, naturallylivingtoday.com, and she's also a board member with the National Association of Nutrition Professionals. So it's a pleasure to have you with us, Sarika. Oh, thank you so much, Paula. It is a joy to be here. And of course, to talk about this really novel therapy, um, it's, it's wonderful to share it with the audience. I had the opportunity to first share on this a version of this presentation this last year for the National Association of Nutrition Professionals. And so if anyone was in attendance there, uh, you may notice this title. Um, but it is such a unique topic that um, we have to just keep sharing on this, I think. So thank you again for the opportunity to do You're so. Welcome. Well, Thanks. I'm really eager, yeah, I'm really eager to learn from your expertise that will support us really both to understand this therapy and then to actually be able to implement this out of the box information. So thanks again. You're welcome. Yes, and I and I kind of want to preface it. Uh, you know, this is going to be a presentation that um, because this is so novel in the West, to me, this is an introductory presentation so that as this information begins to come online more available, um, that the attendees are going to have that good working knowledge uh, mm -hmm. so that it's not just blindsiding them. Mm -hmm. um, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and get started. Well, I wanted to mention a couple of things right before you do because you yeah. so generously offered a copy of your ebook, The Funky oh, Kitchen, for yeah. everyone. Everyone attending this live presentation has access to it, as well as a discount on your accompanying course, Fresh, Fun, and Flavorful in the Funky Kitchen. Um, and this course qualifies for CEUs with the NAMP. And in the course, you learn about the basics of fermentation, culturing, broth making, low heat dehydration and additional aspects of pre-digestion to support clients. So two really great and valuable offers. Thank you so much. I've put the links to both of those in your webinar chat box. Mm -hmm. So grab the links, anybody that's interested, and save them and use them. They've got good value. <laughs> Thank All you right, so Sarika, <laughs> you bet. Um, <laughs> I'm ready to begin when you are, so I'm turning right. it over to you. All right, sounds super. All right, so today I do have a few goals for us. Um, of course, I want to discuss what, you know, the importance of this therapy. 
Um, and when we think of bacterial infections, I think most of us do think of antibiotics. So I want to kind of compare and contrast in light of antibiotics. I want to do just a very brief overview of the history of the therapeutic use of bacteriophage therapy. This, again, will in no way be exhaustive, but it will allow you to kind of go out and do your own research if you really want to dig into this a little bit more. Um, and there are different propagation cycles for bacteriophage therapy. And so I want to discuss what those are. Um, where we're really seeing it used uh, in the West is actually in food production. So I want to share that with you. And then, of course, a practical application, you know, of how this can be used in practice. Again, early days with this, but there actually are some options out there, which is really kind of amazing. So um, let's step right in here. So bacteriophage, my goodness, what is this thing? <laughs> it's pretty wild looking. That really is a micrograph. And um, so what we're looking at here is a bacteriophage. And a bacteriophage is a virus. And um, when we look at the design of it, it really does look to me like something, uh, you know, some type of lunar capsule that's going to land down on a um, planet somewhere. And the very top of that up there is what we call the head of the capsid. And that swirly bit inside is actually the genetic material that is going to be housed within the bacteriophage itself. And then the tail, that kind of tube bit, is the, the part of the bacteriophage that once the bacteriophage comes into contact with its targeted bacteria, uh, lands on it, makes connection with it, um, that tail is what the genetic material comes down through and, and gets pumped into the targeted bacteria. So that is a bacteriophage right there. It really is that kind of crazy looking. Um, and we're talking about really harnessing something here that is just a part of the natural world. Um, bacteriophage are the most ubiquitous substance of this nature in on the planet. And so uh, this isn't that we're creating something new under the sun here. What we're doing is we are harnessing something that is naturally occurring. And where is it often found? Well, it's often found in seawater, um, in animal intestines. And given that we are animals, that includes us as well. It's also rich in soil, also in the start of the tube of our digestive system, you know, in the mouth, in the dental plaque, in the saliva. Um, Chris Smith, he's a CEO of Phage International. Uh, his quote here is, humans and bacteriophages, which are ubiquitous in the environment, have coexisted since humans arrived on the earth, and thus they are very safe. So again, we are just talking about something that is naturally occurring, but what we're doing is we are harnessing it. And that is where the power of it lies as um, a therapeutic value. And so bacteriophage in the human inner ecology is something that actually changes as we age. Um, you know, we can see here that uh, the bacteriophage types that we have, you know, even from our first days and months, which are, of course, passed down uh, from the mother to the child, and, and then, of course, that child's exposure to the environment, uh, there are different bacteriophage that um, the body uh, shows up with. Um, and by the time we get into the adult stage, um, we can have, you know, kind of more of a preponderance of one versus another. Um, so again, a completely normal part of who and what we are. And the replication, this is, you know, where the rubber starts to meet the road. How do these things replicate? Well, again, what are we talking about here? We're talking about viruses. And viruses, of course, are acellular, meaning they need a host for their replication. And the way that they do that, um, there are actually two different formats with which they replicate. And when I, when I have shown this uh, presentation in the past, I had a wonderful little video, but just because of the format of, of how we're able to share today, that didn't show up. Um, but I really encourage you, um, you know, after we're done today, to go online and look for little videos that can show uh, uh, bacteriophage replication, just so you can begin to get a visual of that, because it is something that I find very helpful. 
But um, let me explain it as best I can. <laughs> With the lytic phase, the lytic phase is really, um, as I've spoken to to biochemists who are working with this therapy, the lytic uh, replication method is, is really the preferred method because the way I like to envision it is it's almost like um, filling up a water balloon from a spigot. And what happens is, is remember we had the, our little bacteria phage, it uh, finds its targeted bacteria and when it gets to its targeted bacteria, what it does is it lands onto that targeted bacteria and through the tail, that genetic information is injected into the targeted bacteria. And then it, little virions are created based off of the genetic material of the targeted bacteria. And as these virions are created inside of the targeted bacteria, it's like that water balloon, you know, with the water coming into it. It just continues to fill and fill and fill until it gets to a point where it bursts. And as it bursts forth, what happens is all those little virions, all those new little bacteriophages that are in this place of bacterial infection, this loci of infection, they continue to move forth into the infection site. And so it's just truly, it's just inject, fill, explode, destroy, repeat. <laughs> So it's something that that in that in if we can keep it in that framework, it's it's actually something that's kind of easy to imagine. Well, the lysogenic is a is a different type of replication method. In this method, um, this is one where tinkerings with genetic material inside of of the targeted bacteria that. Can, that is what happens with the lysogenic. And the way I like to think of this method is because it gets into the genetic workings of the targeted bacteria, uh, meaning that it can actually kind of set a time for proper conditions or even a length of time, it appears, for the bacteria to begin to, to change. So it becomes like a zombie and it becomes under the influence of the genetic material from the bacteria phage. This is something that can be a little bit harder to control because we're really getting into uh, genetic uh, machinery. And so that is something, again, from the people in the industry that I've spoken with, that's not one that is, um, is, is looked at so much therapeutically because there are places where things can go a little bit awry. Um, so the lytic replication method uh, tends to be what we see happening most in um, what we're looking to create here. So one of the things, again, that uh, I think is so interesting about this is, of course, how it is that we get to working with, um, you know, a therapy like this. There's this wonderful video, um, and I have the name of it there at the bottom, you know, How Sewage Saved My Husband's Life from a Superbug. It's a TEDx presentation, and um, it is, you know, as UC San Diego here shares with us, uh, in this instance, this is a case study of novel phage therapy saving a patient from multi-drug resistant bacterial infection. And in this instance, what it was is um, it was a couple of, of researchers, people who were actually working in uh, the arena of health, but they were on a vacation together to Egypt. And what had happened is that the husband of this couple, uh, after they had gone into uh, some deep into some pyramids and had just been in that environment, he became violently ill. And um, they had even had some packed antibiotics that they would normally use for, you know, helping to clear up an infection. Um, and that didn't touch what was going on with him. And very quickly, his condition went from bad to worse. He was air backed out. Um, <clears throat> and in, in over a period of months, actually ended up uh, coming to the point of multi-system organ failure. And so tremendous, tremendous sickness for this man. And of course, you know, a litany of different antibiotics used on his behalf and things not working in his body, truly shutting down. He was on life support. And um, talk about knowing the right people. <laughs> this couple, given, you know, what they do professionally, uh, you know, working in uh, epidemiology and the like, they actually knew the right people 
who began to be able to bring together uh, different researchers, people who had stashes, if you will, of the targeted bacteria that um, samples taken from the patient showed he needed support around. And lo and behold, um, it was what he needed. And so I just so encourage you to get to this TEDx presentation again, how sewage saved my husband's life from a superbug, um, so that you can see uh, this very moving um, experience of this woman, you know, needing to sign waivers. You know, this is a therapy that you know has not been shown by the FDA, you know, to be proven. Um, you know, we could be doing something here that can kill your husband. Um, really heavy stuff, and um, to see how actually it ended up truly, truly saving the day. So I do hope that you'll get to that. Dr. Srika, I just want to um, yeah. chime in here because I did see mm -hmm. this video, and and indeed it's quite moving and very dramatic to see a, a, a completely healthy human being fall into disrepair and be facing imminent death. Yeah. We watched him over a period of months um, waste away to almost nothing. He weighed almost nothing at the end. And then the, the defining moment is when he, his wife is giving the presentation on the TEDx talk and at the end he walks out on stage. <laughs> And they embrace each other, you know, it's just, you know, I, I cry almost just thinking about it because it was so moving. It's like, you know, a feel good movie at its best. Anyway, <laughs> take a look, everybody. I call it messy TV. And so, <laughs> yes, definitely plug into that for sure. And it is, it's so important because, I mean, what we're talking about here is this growing concern of antibiotic resistance, which is expected to kill 10 million people annually by 2050 with the path that we're on. And so, you know, uh, CDC deems urgent concerns such as C. diff. I mean, all of us have probably heard of someone who has been challenged with C. diff. There are so many ways that um, these antibiotics are not, they're not taking care of what needs to happen on behalf of these superbug infections. Um, and, you know, as we talk about some of the benefits of bacteriophage therapy, we'll get into, you know, why that has happened. Um, it's it's um, quite a serious situation. And, you know, as mentioned, as Paula was talking at the very beginning of the presentation, it's a century's worth of looking at this, actually over a century's worth. Um, and bacteriophage was a therapy that was, quote unquote, discovered um, <clears throat> around the 1920s. And it was an interesting thing that two people who didn't know of one another nor of one another's work, who were on different continents, um, actually uh, kind of, quote unquote, discovered bacteriophage at the same time. And um, the man that's at the uh, at the bottom picture here, his name is Frederick Cork. He was kind of a classically trained um, uh, medical physician researcher in England. And um, when he first came upon this, uh, as he was studying bacteria, and he would see these places where the bacteria on, you know, a petri dish would not be found, he was thinking maybe it was enzymes that were causing that. Um, but over time, he came to see that it actually was viral matter that was <clears throat> making these places of open space where um, a bacterial infection was not showing up. And then another person at the same time, a French Canadian kind of self trained scientist, um, his name is Felix Durrell. Um, he also came upon this information. You know, it's that sort of hundredth monkey thing. It's amazing to me how how at the right time things start to gel. And um, I have to say, Durrell is an interesting character. Um, he was, like I say, self-taught, traveled the world with his family, and would just go out into the bush um, and use techniques around fermentation. 
um, to, to help with food production, um, and just kind of a fearless person, um, it appears to me from reading about him. So you might enjoy reading up on what's available on this fellow. Um, but he also, uh, at around the same uh, time as Tork, he, he also came upon this like, wow, why is this breaking through these bacterial, um, you know, kind of amalgamations? And um, it was the bacteriophage that he was looking at. Um, he, again, was someone who would take what he found and would be rather bold with it. So we see that he, you know, used bacteriophage in children's hospitals in France. Um, and uh, there were, uh, there was one instance of his work, there was an outbreak of cholera in an Indian village. They had isolated some bacteriophage and they just put it into the well water. And, um, you know, this, this outbreak of cholera uh, was greatly resolved because of getting bacteriophage into the, the drinking water for this community uh, to begin to eradicate the, uh, the issue that was present uh, in that water. And Darrell also, he was part of some commercial production that was happening around bacteriophage um, in kind of the early to middle century. Uh, this actually in Paris, this was marketed by the predecessor to L'Oreal. And so these were over the counter bacteriophage presentations that people could purchase, you know, based off of gut issues, um, you know, uh, sinus infections, things like that, skin infections. And concurrently in the United States, Eli Lilly was doing the same thing. Now, this is interesting because, you know, we had the discovery of penicillin in the early 20th century. And at around, the, you know, kind of similar time, the bacteriophage was discovered as well. And in America, what really, you know, if you look back historically, it really looks like what happened is that in the U.S., we just went full on into the pursuit of using antibiotics and and I think you know with a with an easy eye on history you can understand why it was this kind of blanket um, you know like bomb response to something that was killing people and making people very sick and so um, innocently enough I believe I think that antibiotics really uh, were such a gold standard of care um, and, you know, <laughs> over time, that has kind of uh, uh, wasted away to, to having some real challenges. Well, over in Europe, and notably in Russia, in Georgia, um, and then also in France, Poland, the use of bacteriophage and their de development uh, was something that really uh, took hold in that area. And um, so I find it very interesting that um, while, you know, antibiotics were going big here in the United States, you had the pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly, um, actually using these products and, and bringing them to market uh, commercially. So these were, these were actually the descriptions from what I found related to these products from Eli Lilly in the 1940s. And as you read here, I mean, they covered a lot. The issue that you get into with bacteriophage and creating them in a way that is going to be shelf stable, um, that is going to maintain the integrity of the bacteriophage for the targeted um, bacteria because of bacterial mutations, these are some of the issues that made um, the over-the-counter use of these types of products uh, not completely viable. Um, so it, it sort of fell out of use, but um, I do think it's very interesting that here in the States, one of our largest pharmaceutical companies actually was pursuing this. So back to France, the Pasteur Institute, um, they really went after staph infections. Their, their research around that, of course, also Pseudomonas, Proteus, and Coliform as well. Um, but, you know, those staph infections, we think of MRSA, right? That's a huge one. Um, but, you know, and that can hit bone, you know, the heart, respiration. It can lead to full-on septicemia throughout this, the entire system. So, um, you know, to have multiple modes of administration against these staph infections is very powerful. So, of course, you know, as you see here, the sore on someone's wrist, local application, um, also though injection or IV injection, GI dispersion into blood by consumption. So these are some of the ways that the Pasteur Institute, uh, you know, researched and used uh, 
bacteriophage uh, in their institute's care for patients. Phages, phages in Poland um, uh, also have uh, undergone a lot of research and development. The Hertzfield Institute of Immunology and Experimental Therapy was founded in 1954. Um, they have, you know, what appears to be a 75 to 100 percent cure rate, but the difficulty is, is um, really being able to discern the validity of that. Um, so uh, apparently things have gone very well with bacteriophages in Poland, but, uh, you know, because of translation issues and also just different standards of, of testing and research uh, parameters around that, there may be, um, there may be, you know, things not quite connecting in that regard. Uh, but apparently it seems like things have gone well in Poland as well. Uh, Georgia, Russia, the Eliava Institute, um, they took uh, pathogenic strains from throughout the Soviet Union and the man that's there is George Eliava. Um, and at their height, they had a staff of 1,200 creating two tons a week of bacteriophage. That is a lot of sewage and, and yuckiness to get through to create two tons a week of it. But they were using it predominantly for soldiers for diarrheal and uh, wound presentations. And similar to what Eli Lilly was doing and what Durrell was doing with that predecessor to L'Oreal uh, was creating a public use. So again, no prescription needed. Um, and the thing that was different about what was happening with these phage um, uh, productions from the LA the Ava Institute is that they were updated regularly. And that's really important because, you know, we've all seen this. Heck, we see this happen with the flu. You know, I mean, what's happening down in the Southern Hemisphere uh, with the variations that happen with the flu presentation, that has impact on what is created for the flu vaccination by the time it comes to the Northern Hemisphere uh, in the second part of the year. Uh, and it's because of these types of mutations. And so similarly, uh, what the Eliava Institute would do is, you know, they would they would kind of track what were the, the, the latest manifestations and get cultures of the latest manifestation of a given illness. And then a new phage would be created in response to that. So it was a very nimble, a very responsive way um, to work with this bacterial mutation uh, concern. Pretty amazing. And then phages in Russia, they also appear to have had extensive use, notably for soldiers, children, and infants. But similar to Poland, you know, we've got these language and, and here even national security concerns uh, in relation to sharing information. Uh, again, diarrhea is a big one. I mean, that kills people. And so um, I think we can easily see why that would be a focus. Um, and uh, in terms of application, uh, similar to antibiotics, you know, creams, injections, liquids, uh, where we could use it for enemas or even tampons. Um, and then also in Russia, it appears they created the first uh, tablet stable format, which is interesting. Oftentimes the phages need to be in a uh, broth solution. That's what carries them. And so here's another um, case study. Uh, this is a very recent one. Um, as we see here, 2018 was when this was published. So that was this year. And <clears throat> what we're talking about here is um, a graft of new tissue. So in this instance, an aortic graft. And uh, Pseudomonas, we've seen that all already. It's a bacterium that's prevalent in the natural and artificial environments, and it's listed as an increasingly antibiotic-resistant priority pathogen. So again, talking about that, that concern. Um, these infections are difficult to manage in part due to intrinsic antibiotic resistance and their ability to form biofilms. We're going to talk about that in a minute and how it is that bacteriophage are different in that regard. Success is achieved when phage kills the targeted bacterium, and success is also achieved when bacteria evolve phage resistance because they suffer increased sensitivity to clinically approved antibiotics. And so if you want to go check out this article, you'll see that what they did in this instance was they helped this person to recover from <clears throat> this infection, and they used the phage to begin to weaken the uh, the targeted bacteria in part by getting through the biofilm that is a mucopolysaccharide kind of covering that protects the bacteria. 
antibiotics can't penetrate that, but there are different phages that can penetrate certain biofilms. And so in doing so, <clears throat> what they did on this patient's behalf is they created kind of a one-two punch. They were able to get into the biofilm. The phage were able to work against the, uh, the targeted bacteria to some degree, begin to weaken it, but then they used an antibiotic concurrent with this that then got in and, and finished the job. And this is just me wondering. I'm wondering if, if the antibiotic would have been really even necessary. I don't know. I don't know if that's the thinking of, well, we just want to make sure we got everything. Um, and maybe it really was necessary. Um, but uh, I think that, I think that again, this is in such early stages that are, there's, there's a tendency maybe to want to um, hold on to uh, older uh, practices. And then at the same time, if we're using a broad spectrum antibiotic, um, you know, there can be co-infections that a phage will not touch the, the other. So say we have, um, you know, a very targeted bacteriophage for the pseudomonas uh, at, that we have here, but then maybe there is a concurrence, um, you know, there could be a concurrent E. coli infection, I'm just going to say. The phage won't touch that E. coli infection, whereas a broad spectrum antibiotic might. And so because of co-infections, that could be where the use of an antibiotic could be helpful. So I'm hoping you can see some of the ways that we can start to think about this therapy. So as mentioned at the beginning, really where this is being used, um, I would say more than anywhere in the West is in food production, which is so interesting. Like I did not know that. <laughs> and, um, so uh, despite of advances in modern technologies, the food industry is continuously challenged with the threat of a microbial contamination. And I think we can all understand that. I mean, we are trying to feed so many people uh, it's not easy. <laughs> and part of the reason is, is the overuse of antibiotics, which has further escalated the problem, resulting in the increasing emergence of antibiotic resistant foodborne pathogens. And when we talk about antibiotics, I'm not just talking about, you know, antibiotic residues that get into the wastewater, um, you know, from human consumption, but of course the use of antibiotics in food production, which isn't just taking care of animals when they are sick because maybe they are not in the best environment for them, nor being fed the best foods for them, but also, and even more so, because antibiotics are often used to fatten up the animals. And so that also is a huge player in this antibiotic resistant uh, scenario. So accordingly, bacteriophages and their derivatives have emerged as novel, viable, and safe options for the prevention, treatment, and or eradication of these contaminants in a range of food and food processing environments. And towards a food safety perspective, strictly lytic phase, phages, remember those are the water balloon ones, they are possibly one of the most harmless antibacterial approaches available. So that's a pretty darn amazing statement. And the reason that that is so powerful to me is because I've, I've touched on it just a little bit with what I said about how, you know, if a person has a pseudomonas uh, infection of a very specific type, but they've also got a co-infection of E. coli, the, the bacteriophage is not going to touch the E. coli. The way that I like to think of bacteriophage um, is, they're a lot like homeopathy to me. With a homeopathic remedy, if it's the right remedy for what your needs are, then it is something that is going to work brilliantly on your behalf to help you recover from what those symptoms are. Whereas um, if it isn't something that you need, it's going to pass through you, it's not going to hurt you, it's a no harm, no foul kind of scenario. It's the same thing with the bacteriophage. If I were to take a bacteriophage for a specific strain of salmonella infection, but I had no issue with salmonella inside of me, then that would not harm me in any way. Those bacteriophage would pass right through me. And so that, it, I hope you can see, compared to you know, having antibiotics floating around in the, you know, the water system, um, these bacteriophage actually have a transfer of effect that can be very powerful, but 
but at the same time can be completely benign if it's not needed. So the most common foodborne pathogens of animal origin are Listeria, E. coli, Campylobacter, and Salmonella. And um, I want to just go into a little bit of how bacteriophage are being used in each of these. And so these little pictures that I'll have on each of these slides are actually the, the targeted bacteria. So there's some Listeria for you to check out. It's a gram-positive motile intracellular bacterium that grows in many food matrices and storage conditions. So we can find this in a lot of different places. It's often transmitted in ready-to-eat foods as well as poultry and dairy products. So that that amounts to a lot of food that we eat here in the West. It has a very minimal incidence, but boy, if you get sick with this stuff, it's a big deal. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's something that, you know, we lose about 255 people a year to it in the U.S. Um, the phage applications, the way that it's being used, are based off of post-harvest use. So let's say it was a chicken. And uh, so it wouldn't be that we would be feeding uh, Listeria bacteriophage to the chicken. It would be after the chicken has been slaughtered and it's been processed, one of its phases of processing, then bacteriophage would be added to the, the, uh, the created product there. Phages for Listeria are most influenced by contact time and dose more than the actual temperature itself. So um, they're definitely being used in that arena. Here's some E. coli, and this is a gram-negative bacterium. Um, as we're probably aware, they are prolific in ruminant intestines as well as fecal matter or dust that might be on that animal's hide. Um, contamination through undercooked meats um, or also through raw milk or water that have had cross-contamination with that fecal matter. You know, that's very simple. Little cow, you know, smacks its uh, tail and it's got a little bit of feces on it with some E. coli in it and the dust goes flying into the milk or something. Uh, highly virulent. We hear about people getting sick with E. coli, you know, these kind of large outbreaks at least once a year, it seems. And the phage therapy has mainly focused on poultry and ruminants with mixed success when administered pre-harvest. So that means we would be giving them E. coli bacteriophage, you know, like in their water, maybe on their food, something like that. However, all post-harvest applications since 2000 have proven effective both on the meat and on production and serving equipment. So really good success uh, in that post-production uh, phase. Campylobacter. It's a gram-negative spiral motile bacterium, and it has a very low dose ingestion uh, causing bloody diarrhea, fever, and abdominal pain. Uh, averaging about 845,000 hospitalizations a year. That's a lot of people, and that is not a good way to be sick. Um, capable of colonizing in the bowels of poultry and cattle with human infection, mostly through the fecal oral contact um, coming through contaminated raw foods and drinking water, you know, with some fecal bacteria in both of those. The pre-harvest phage application has shown a reduction in bacterial numbers and post-harvest application has shown positive effect in two separate scenarios. So that's pretty promising. And then good old salmonella. Uh, Gram-negative bacterium considered to be one of the principal causes of human-animal cross-interaction diseases in the world. It can colonize and persist within the GI tract. You know, this could be your patient who is just kind of malingering. Um, you're, you, you're doing all the right things, but there, there's just this low-grade something continuing to go on. It could be salmonella in the crypts of the bowel. And so human salmonella poisoning is often associated, of course, with consumption of contaminated animal foods. You know, we hear about, you know, <clears throat> don't have your Caesar salads made with raw eggs and that sort of thing, nor your mayonnaise, um, but also found in poultry, of course, pork and beef. Uh, in that order, um, <clears throat> and also coming into contact with, uh, you know, like turtles, water turtles, they can share some salmonella too. This can present with fever, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, and life-threatening aspects. Uh, in usage, two pre-harvest phage applications have been approved by the FDA, either to be sprayed on the animals or on their feed. Um, and then all post-harvest phages have shown effect on raw meats, ready-to-eat foods, and produce. So again, very promising. When it is ingested, if it's something that your body needs, it will get in there. It will help to recover it. If it's something that your body doesn't need, it will pass right through you. So how do we isolate bacteriophage? 
So when you see that picture there, when I see that picture there, that reminds me of rice pudding, um, but it's not. <laughs> it's the enrichment of a chosen sample of bacteria. And what you see there, uh, the kind of opaque, uh, milky looking, that is, uh, that's the treated area with the bacteria. And then the little kind of grayish, um, clear spots are the places where the bacteriophage have actually gone in and have done their work of destroying the bacteria in that area. So a nutri I mean, in a nutshell, um, a nutritional medium is infected with the bacteria and that bacteria turns opaque. And then the bacteria that are infected with phages, they die, which, you know, as we've talked about, the water balloon example, that produces new phages. And in that area, the medium clears up. So that's those little darker circles there. And then that medium is filtered through a chosen filter, which holds back the bacteria and the larger objects and only allows the smaller phages to pass through. And so that's how we get bacteriophage. And where do we get bacteriophage? From sewage. And I, that's pretty much where you're going to find it. Um, so this, uh, what it, <laughs> there's, there's lots of sewage. So um, that, you know, if you know you have a place where there has been um, infection with a given bacteria, uh, you know, where people are really struggling with it, you will also find bacteriophage there. And so it's going to be uh, using that sewage as your refinement uh, media. So um, I hope that I've talked up some of the great things about bacteriophage and you're, and you're getting excited about this, but I also want to talk about some, some of the challenges around this therapy. Um, one is the generation and the isolation of the lytic phages, again, the, the water balloon type. Uh, that, again, is what tends to be used therapeutically. Again, the lysogenic, the zombie ones, those can convert phage-sensitive bacteria to insensitive ones and can possibly even encode toxins. And so that's one that, again, the tinkering with that uh, is maybe not something we want to be pursuing too much therapeutically, at least not with what we know at this point. Um, I've touched on this, the ability to maintain and deliver formulations that maintain their viability and also are going to be viable uh, based off of any bacterial mutations. Um, also, one of the challenges is a need for sequencing to ensure that we don't have any undesirable genes, which could be toxic. Um, so we do have to be mindful of this. We are dealing with, you know, a, a living entity, if you will. And because it is protein-based and biologically active, it may cause reaction in some subjects, um, you know, a type of anaphylactic uh, presentation. So we do have to be aware of that. Um, now, has that happened? Not that I've read a whole lot of, but I understand uh, the concern around that. So let's look a little bit at comparing phages and antibiotics together. So the bactericidal function of lytic phages is they remove bacterial viability. Dead. It's done. Um, I, I hope you can see that what happens with these is, you know, they explode into the place of infection and they just destroy it as they continue to go deeper. Whereas some antibiotics are bacteriostatic, such as tetracycline, <clears throat> this allows for potential resistance. You know, as that, as that bacteria is kind of frozen in space and it comes back on, online again, uh, that is where some changes with uh, bacterial mutation can possibly occur. Um, Autodosing. Um, uh, phages, they increase their density more in areas of high infection. Uh, that is really one of the most impressive things to me about this type of therapy is how in a loci of infection, they just continue to move forward. The more infection there is, the more bacteriophages are going to be created until you get to the end of that mass. And at the end of that mass where there's no more bacteria to continue to, um, to hook onto, if you will, and get the virions happening and exploding forth, then the bacteriophages that remain, they will just pass from the system. Whereas antibiotics, 
they have kind of an inverse presentation. They lose their potency as they penetrate into areas of infection. And that's why we need continued dosing of antibiotics. And, you know, why you're told to never, um, you know, take uh, an antibiotic for less than its course of time. Um, it, it, they really need this continued dosing. So that's a big difference between these two therapies. Toxicity. Phage toxicity is very low, though again, there may possibly um, occur an anaphylactic response uh, to the protein components of the lysed bacteria. Um, so that is one concern. Antibiotic toxicity, however, has been reviewed extensively and notably to the nervous system, and in some people that can be very severe. And then I think most of us, when we think of antibiotics, we think of flora destruction and, you know, this kind of collateral damage that happens to the good, bad, and, and, and different bacteria uh, when we are working with antibiotics. Phage are very specific. I hope you're understanding that with what I'm sharing here. They are only minimally impactful to the health protecting flora because they are targeted on just what they're targeted on. So there isn't this collateral damage which is different than antibiotics, which tend to be broad spectrum and are prone to inducing super infections, you know, things like C. diff or lending themselves toward candida overgrowth, that sort of thing. Resistance concerns. Facias have a low host range, you know, again, uh, so even, you know, talking about E. coli, you know, there are going to be different strains of E. coli. And so the, they are as specific as the very specific strain that they are targeting in E. coli. So there could be other strains of E. coli that they're not going to have impact upon. And so their resistance range because of that is much, much shorter. Whereas antibiotics have a broad range of bacteria that they can affect. And so there's a greater chance of mutated resistance. Um, that's, that's quite a big deal right there. Um, and again, that is also impacted, I believe, because of this, uh, how they lose their potency, um, you know, very different than the bacteria phase into the area of infection. So again, we have to continue to really dose to make sure you get it all cleared out of there. That also can impact the phage potency. The lack of cross resistance uh, that happens with phage is because they kill differently than antibiotics, and so they can be used when antibiotics lose their effectiveness. We saw that a little bit in the case study, the second case study that I was mentioning. There. The discovery time frame, so there's some sewage. Phages are easily located, usually in sewage, um, whereas for antibiotics, the isolation can be quite difficult. Um, especially to culture specific bacteria. Um, and in doing so, it's interesting that the phage, uh, as we're getting into this discovery time frame, they, they don't present the toxicity that antibiotics can. So uh, that again is, is, is a big difference between the two. The versatility of both is pretty good. Um, you know, uh, as noted in some of these earlier slides, um, application creams, ingestibles, liquids, they can be formulated into different types of cocktails um, and in different formats for what's needed. Now the biofilms. <laughs> this is a really big thing. Um, the phages have the ability to clear at least some biofilms. And again, in that case study, we see that was part of the therapeutic value that was being used in that situation. Whereas antibiotics are hindered by biofilms. They really, that does not appear that they can get in there. And so what happens is, you know, these little centuries of bacteria uh, <clears throat> underneath this kind of, uh, <laughs> it reminds me of the biosphere that we have here in Arizona. You know, it's this big dome that, you know, you have this entire world living under. And that's like what a biofilm is. Um, it's this protective encasement that the bacteria put around themselves. And so they send up a little sentry to go kind of check, check the air, if you will, out there beyond the biofilm. And what they're able to discern, oh, it's not safe out there. No, no, it's not good. And that information that can come back on the sentry or the sentry dying by coming into contact with that, that is the, the place where uh, bacterial mutation can occur. And we can get this drug resistance as a result of it. <clears throat> and so because some phages can penetrate some biofilms, that's a really big deal. It just takes that away. And then the dose. 
interesting, um, again, because these the phages amplify into the infection site, we generally need fewer doses for clearance. Um, so they only increase in the infection site if they are killing, and then they don't linger. There's, no, there's nothing more for them to do there. They pass through. Antibiotics generally require, of course, a course of dosing and maybe a second and then maybe a different antibiotic. So there's quite a difference there. And then this transfer of effect, I was touching on this a little bit earlier when I was talking about how antibiotics are being used in um, animal food production. Beige's effect can be carried from one host to another, which is notably useful in agriculture, but it doesn't have any harm if needed. So if we've got this big nasty strain of salmonella going through um, you know, a bunch of chickens, um, and we put some bacteriophage into the water in one chicken and it's for salmonella and it's specific to that strain and that chicken drinks it and goes through the system that is going to then of course what it will pass through the chicken system and then the next chicken that might be pecking around on the ground gets a little bit of that bacteriophage through its beak into its system and so it has this transfer of effect that is is very good in this regard Whereas antibiotics in industrial food production are one of the main factors in antibiotic resistance. So uh, very different uh, in, when we consider transfer of effect between these two types of therapies. So <clears throat> there's, as I've mentioned, these are early days with bacteriophage treatment. Um, it's it's uh, amazing to me, quite honestly, that we do have different um, supplement companies that are beginning to use this, given that it is so novel. And this is not necessarily an exhaustive list, but these are some companies that you may want to consider looking at if bacteriophage is something that you have an interest in. Um, from what I have seen, um, I think systemic formulas of Ogden, Utah has uh, the most uh, variety. Um, and most specific to a given concern. So for instance, the EC is uh, used for uh, certain strains of E. coli. Um, and so there, there are products out there that you can consider, but again, early, early stages. Um, but pretty neat that this is available. Um, you know, for instance, the salmonella, as I was talking, you know, I mean, if that's hanging around in one of your patient's uh, bellies and uh, it, they're just malingering, how wonderful to be able to use a product that, that can go after just what that issue is and then not cause other collateral damage. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, if you know, you'd like to continue learning with me. Um, you know, Paula had mentioned uh, that I'm offering a discount on my continuing education course for the Funky Kitchen, which I go into the how, what, and why of pre-digestion to help support uh, nutrition uh, at its finest for the body. Um, and then, of course, um, a free download of the ebook of the Funky Kitchen um, for attending. So thank you. Thank you for your time. It's really been fun. I hope this has been a great experience for you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Srika. It, it's been, you know, a, a, a second time around wow factor for me. <laughs> great. <laughs> And um, we have some good questions, I think. Are you ready for that? I am. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, the um, first question about the sewage that's used, is mm -hmm. it used before treatment? Well, no. Um, I would imagine not, because we really do need to have the bacteria there. Um, and in turn, we need to then, of course, have the bacteriophage. So if we're using, when we talk about treatment, we're using some kind of, you know, bactericidal, even like chlorine bleach, you know, something like that. That's right. going to be knocking things out. Um, mm -hmm. So no, we want to have the funk there. <laughs> and, uh, and then in turn, we can begin to harness the bacteriophage. So I, I, I'm, I'm not clear. I don't think I was clear in the response. Is the sewage, has it been treated? I don't think so. Yeah, no, okay. I don't think so. That's what I mean. You know, when right. we treat something, we're going to be adding something, you know, that's going to clean that. So again, it would be like chlorine, you know, exactly. the different types of chemicals that are used. So that would just start knocking everything out. So no, I'm pretty sure they're working with just raw sewage. And do you know how they get it? They just put their cup uh, out, put a bucket yeah, on? Yeah, it's about like that, you know, get the pipe 
cut, suck it up in there and get it on to uh, the, the media on the Petri dish. Because your photo of, of sewage going right into the ocean yes. was kind of like, you know, appalling. It's horrible. <laughs> a number of reasons, <laughs> but then maybe not, right? Right. <laughs> So the next comment question is about using the potential use for these with tampons. Yeah. And the thought that came up for a couple of people was like, <laughs> oh, great, glyphosates and bacteriophages. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, bummer. I know. If we could just do without the glyphosate, that would be a problem. But I mean, I, I know personally in my practice, you know, I've, I've had women that I've worked with who have very localized, uh, you know, vaginal infections, UTIs, things like that. Mm -hmm. And if we were able to use something that would go, I mean, if we knew what was going on, you know, say there'd been a culture done of, you know, the tissue down there and, um, or, you know, the exudate, if you will. And we were able to see what we were going after. And we were able then to use a bacteriophage uh, that, you know, had been wet down um, onto a tampon and that inserted into the vagina. That would give an incredible opportunity to clear up that localized infection without doing any harm to the, the native flora that is helpful and healthy in, in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. So amazing. You, you've used <laughs> this in a situation like that? No, because I haven't. That's what I mean. Early days here. I yes. wish I could. If I, it, But I hope I just added that up uh, from a clinical picture of how that could be so powerful for somebody. Absolutely. And, you know, that you likened it to homeopathy was, mm -hmm. you know, I really appreciated that, that correlation because... Mm -hmm. No harm, you know, no match, right. no harm, right? Right, right. We rarely get such a bonus. <laughs> I know, <laughs> <That we> do. <laughs> truly. Do, um, you know, this is a question that comes down to lab testing and stool mm -hmm. tests in general and um, finding E. coli in anywhere from a one plus to a four plus. I, I personally have seen a, a large number of four pluses suddenly mm -hmm. coming through on, on stool tests. So. Um, and, you know, I've heard one MD actually say, well, it's normal. Everybody has E. coli. Don't mm -hmm. worry about it. And I'm like, I don't really think so. A four plus is something I think yeah. I need yeah. attention to, right? <laughs> exactly. But, um, I mean, then you, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I'm wondering if different strains then yes. are, are needed for the different forms of E. coli. Exactly. That's exactly wow. it. Um, and that's what I was trying to get to a few times in the presentation, um, that the different strains are, if it's not the target of, of the bacteriophage, it's not going to harm it. Whereas if we know, yeah, that specific strain of E. coli that is high numbers and this person is showing up symptomatic, they are not well, if we could use a bacteriophage, it would be very targeted against those high numbers of that specific strain, but then allow the proper, uh, you know, uh, uh, hanging out, if you will, the, uh, of the rest of the E. coli, because E. coli is, is absolutely a normal part of the bacterial profile of many people. Uh, but it is something that can get out of out of proper range um, mm -hmm. specific strains and it can also of course show up in the wrong places um, you know and so that can be very problematic as well and so again if we had something that could just go after that oh my gosh how fabulous so uh, you know I've also looked at the, the, the source products and companies that are that mm -hmm. are making these and and the ones that are supportive of E. coli, it's like, it's just E. coli. On a lab test, it doesn't tell you what kind of E. coli it is, and the products don't say what kind of E. coli it's for. So do you have any no. suggestions of how to proceed from there? Or we're just still in, in a I, creative phase here with this. Still, yeah. Um, Dr. Shane Morris, who is the chief uh, formulator um, at Systemic Formulas, he and I were talking about that. Um, <clears throat> what he, as as I was showing in the presentation, um, you know, we'll get these mutations that can happen, and so he will reformulate uh, some of the formulas from time to time to reflect what 
seems to be the biggest kind of preponderance of issue related to a specific strain. Um, and so that is that kind of nimble approach that um, is very powerful. I guess the thing that I would want to say about that, Paula, is uh, so for instance, I have the E. coli bacteriophage from systemic formulas here in my office. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> if someone came to me and they said, Strika, I had some labs done and I was like four plus, you know, with my E. coli, you had better believe that the bacteriophage for E. coli would be what I would use for that person as part of their support. Um, because again, going back to this issue of the homeopathic metaphor, um, if it works for them, it can be phenomenal. If it doesn't, it's not going to hurt them. And so um, that's the angle I would be coming from. Okay, great. Thank you. Great answer. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question asking if you would please explain gram positive versus gram negative, what that means. That's just, those are different differentiations between the types of bacteria, their, their characteristics and their qualities. And um, I, would, I would suggest you just go online and read into that a little bit more. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then you spoke to the, um, the pre-harvest phages and the application mm -hmm. by the FDA to spray on animal feed. And, and was it a suggestion that they might be using it on no. raw food for human consumption or they are using it now? No, they are using it. I mean, so in the, and so the post harvest, mm -hmm. that is going on to certain foods. Uh, and that's why in, in, as I was talking about one of those, it might've been salmonella, I can't recall. But I was saying, you know, once it's on the food um, and say you were to eat it and it would still be viable by the time you, it got to you. Mm -hmm. um, if it's something that would benefit you, it would pass through you and, you know, do what it needed to do and then leave you be. Um, so, no, this is, many of these are post-harvest, uh, but there's a viability window as well um, <clears throat> in terms of the bacteriophage. Um, and in fact, uh, speaking with Dr. Morris, you know, for instance, the bacteriophage uh, liquid supplements that I have, I believe yes. their, their viability window, once they have been opened, is about two to three weeks or so. And once so, the bottle has been opened, even yes. though it's still capped? Okay. Yeah, and so that's something that we have to take into consideration with food production. So it may have been, you know, very viable, very alive when it was, uh, you know, used, but then it loses that viability. Okay. So that brings me to um, what's for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about what's for dinner after this. And I just have to say, you, you really kind of wrecked it for me in terms I'm of rice so pudding sorry. or tapioca pudding, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I did it not look like tapioca pudding. <laughs> oh, my like dear. those are my, my, my comfort foods when I'm needing my mother. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, All right. Dear. Sorry, that was just a little aside. But um, one, one good last question here. Yes. How do we know if a phage got it all? Well, you're going to feel better. <laughs> That's going to be a big part. And, and the thing about it, too, is going back to the homeopathy thing, mm -hmm. if, if it's the right phage and, and you're wondering, then take some more. Mm -hmm. You know, because if it's, if, if it's all gone and you're clear, uh, then the phage will just pass through you. It's not, it, it should not cause any harm at all. Um, whereas if there's a little bit left, um, but when we talk about how they work by going into, you know, the area of infection and just keep increasing there until they're not needed anymore, yeah. uh, the use of these tends to be something that, that uh, when it's put to the right place and the delivery gets there the way that it needs to, it really seems to take care of the issue. But you could dose again. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm remembering, recalling, watching the video, the TEDx talk, um, and it seemed like once he started recovering, yeah. they, they, you know, continued treatment and, mm -hmm. um, you know, continued it for, for quite a while as he was building health. I mean, this man had needed to learn to walk again. Yeah. You know, he lost so much function of everything. Yeah. But 
um, but yeah, treatment was extensive for him. It was. So what uh, the way that I read the way that that presentation went, the bacteriophage uh, for the, the Arachobacter, which is what he was infected with, and it was an Egyptian strain. Um, he, um, the bacteriophage is what stopped the infection uh, mm -hmm. from continuing to shut down his organs. But the wasting and the challenge to his body as a result of how sick he had become was where so much of the therapy lied for him. Yeah. Um, yes. so, yeah. So, you know, there's this caution around going into pyramids, but, but it also <laughs> speaks to me that, um, you know, here's somebody coming from the United States. Right. They obviously had, had traveled extensively prior, but he was exposed to something that his immune system had never seen before. Okay. So maybe he only, he didn't have any immune defense for it within his own system. And so it could ravage him like that. Do you, does that? Uh, it totally rings true to me. Yes. I, and I think that's an excellent way of framing it because <clears throat> that's exactly right. The bacteriophage that would be there as a counterpoint to that would be something probably that the people who live in that area um they they very well may have that as part of what they're exposed to regularly and so they're not getting sick the way that he did um and boy doesn't this speak to you know the travel concerns that we see yeah. people talk about you know and they go to india or they go to mexico something like that in fact uh bacteriophage being so prevalent in uh seawater you know waters um yeah. <clears throat> they it, it's it, it's figured that the the healing waters, such as the Ganges, which is so um, impregnated with yes. um, you know feces, it's it's really quite dirty water. But it's also rich in bacteriophage. You would think, and, yeah. Yes, and so it's something that it's been considered healing waters against things like leprosy and that sort of thing. And it's considered that maybe bacteriophage might be the reason for that. Amazing. Yes. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Therapy <laughs> will to enter the blessed waters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this also, I mean, you know, this is a world issue. Traveling is a world yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking Lyme disease here alone as a I world know. issue and all the different strains that are merging worldwide now. Exactly. The Lyme, the co-infections, the biofilm, yeah. it, it, mm -hmm. it stuns me of the potential for this. And Lyme is a tricky critter because of how much it changes once it really begins to take hold in the body. But it's at early war. phases, yeah, it just morphs. It's so weird. Um, but in early phases, that was one of the main things that I talked to Dr. Morris about when I first started looking at this, you know, with him, um, was what about Lyme? And, um, you know, really early phases, early exposure, of course, is probably where one would find uh, the best outcome. But it's uh, even with that, you would think that would be the one that, boy, we could ride that magic bullet. Um, and I, I have not seen a lot of press around that yet, but I like okay. the thinking on it. All right. No, it's, you know, with early phases, you know, everything is, you know, early phases mm -hmm. with, with Lyme, right? How to, how to yes. approach it. But so many people are dealing with extended, you know, chronic Lyme. Um, I know. And then, and then the combination is like Lyme almost never happens alone. You see it with metals and mold and, and, you yes. know, which came first and which provoked the That's other. Right. But, but it's a package anymore. It is a package, yes. And then you have some people who have exposure, they've tested positive, and it's like they had a cold. I mean, it's like nothing. And so that also gets into a person's genetic makeup and, and you know, who they are um, and, and why it is that something like that can be so uneventful for some and so devastating for others. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. This brings us to the end of the, of the questions. Do you have anything else in closing, Dr. Srika? Oh, thank you, Paula. I just really encourage folks to get out there and research this. You know, we keep talking about this great TEDx presentation, but there are others now. And um, <clears throat> please go check that out. Um, and, uh, and 
And I encourage you also when you're working with your practitioners, um, you know, your own personal practitioner, or even going to see your doctor, please chirp up about this type of therapy so that it starts to become more of a common language around it. <clears throat> so it doesn't seem so strange to people um, because I really do believe that this is going to, this can have such an incredible impact on, on the human experience in a positive way. Thank you very much for those closing comments and this fine presentation and being bold enough to um, come out and, and, and share, you know, share this new and emerging, in, at least in, in, in the West, mm -hmm. the, this information and resources. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. I have a few closing comments, if you don't mind, hang with me just a little bit. I want to encourage everybody and remind them of the um, pre ebook that Dr. Srika has offered, as well as the discount on the associated course that she has. I posted the links both in the question and answer panel um, as, as well as in the chat box. So you can pick them up before you leave. Anybody that didn't, please get in touch with me by email afterwards. And a reminder that this webinar was recorded and it'll be up um, on the Hawthorne website. You can find it under archived webinars. It'll be up in just a few days by Friday at the latest. There will be a survey to fill out after this webinar ends in just a few minutes. So it really helps us to have your feedback and any comments about this presentation. So we appreciate you taking the time so very much for us. Our next webinar is Tuesday, September 18th with Dr. Mary Ellen Chalmers. She's a functional dentist. She'll be talking to us about functional dentistry and how to work with us in our practices. So I'm really excited to bring you this important information and, and Dr. Chalmers is a terrific pre uh, presenter and dentist <laughs> and the information can literally be life-changing like bacteria phase. So also a reminder about our next All About alumni series is Wednesday, September 5th at noon with our Master of Science Holistic Nutrition graduate, Margot Kirshner. She's going to be presenting about her abundant post-graduation activities, so I hope you'll join me for that too. And this does conclude today's presentation, so thank you again so much, Dr. Sarika. Thank you so much. Everyone take good care. Yeah, and thank everybody for sharing this educational experience together. I wish you all the best of health. And I look forward to learning more together at Hawthorne's webinar series and our All About Alumni. Thanks, everybody. Bye for now.